Now, there's a very conventional view of policy, which you will have heard many times, and many people still believe it, well, many people assume that it still happens, even if they believe that it actually doesn't. And this is, as it were, the linear view, the technical view of policy that exists in a series of stages. And, you know, again, many policy text, policy analysis textbooks present this as how policy is done. And you can see echoes of this in real policy processes. But I want to argue equally that this linear view is not actually what happens. Because all of the dynamics that we've been talking about, uh, all of the uncertainties that we were talking about yesterday, all of the politics that we're going to be talking about today and in other sessions, uh, intervened to make this uh, rather more uh, non-linear uh, than is suggested. But the sort of standard view is that you have to understand the policy issue, there's an agenda setting process, essentially a, a political process, you explore possible options for resolving the problem, um, that's when the, the, the technocrats get involved, researchers are hired in, the consultants are assessed, you weigh up the costs and benefits, risks and, and, and returns, uh, that's where your risk assessment, you know, classically your risk assessment or cost-benefit analysis comes in, again, a technical uh, approach. And then, in the end, a rational choice is made about the best option. Then the policy is implemented, you evaluate the outcome, and round it goes. And you know, you'd be surprised how often these, uh, this sort of model of policy making is, is presented as the way things happen. But of course, this gives extra weight to a particular form of rational policy making that we'll come to, and there are a particular relationship between science and policy, which, uh, as we'll see, is rather problematic. And it's problematic for a number of reasons, and these are some. First, that there is this assumption that values and facts, that politics and knowledge, are somehow separated. That truth, in other words, just speaks to power, and that's uh, a simple relationship that can be sustained. This, as we all know in this room, uh, is not the case. It also assumes that bureaucratic administrative processes are sim simply executive. They simply just take a policy, implement it as it were, as it, as it is. But as most of you know, most policies are not specified at that level of detail, and there's all sorts of things that go on in the process of implementation. And when we're thinking about policy processes, we're not just interested in the creation of the piece of paper that is labelled policy, but we're interested in the whole chain of activity right through to action on the ground. And that's when we have to understand the social, the political, the practical nature of how knowledge uh, and practices interact with politics in bureaucratic administrative procedures. And there is, the, of course, the naive assumption in here that particular forms of expertise and methods, such as cost-benefit analysis or risk assessment, are uh, automatically independent, objective, and scientific in that sense. And we discussed that already, how they have uh, created legitimacy, they're constructed forms of knowledge, and therefore have to be uh, debated over. So how does policy then change? What um, I have here are, again, three different lenses on the questions of policy change. And this equally covers a vast, vast literature that I'm not going to be able to even give remote justice to. But first, there is a set of very important literature in the political sciences which talks about the competition and bargaining between different interests and different interest groups. And this can be framed in terms of the pluralist, society-centred accounts of Dao or more state-centred versions or uh, linked to understandings of bureaucratic politics and competition between <coughs> ministries or departments or bits of the broader polity. Whatever perspective you, you take, and, and I think each of these are relevant to different settings, some have come out of a more 
US tradition, some have come out of a more European tradition, and I'm so sure as applied, say, in India or China, one would draw on very different uh, or different combinations of these insights. But the basic question is about how different groups of people compete and bargain over different views of what policy should be. In other words, what is the policy, politics of competition and bargaining around future pathways, if you like? But that's quite macro, that's quite broad understanding at a sort of society and political level of what politics is. There's a whole set of other literatures that takes it down to a slightly finer grain and asks, okay, within this broader perspective of, of the wider politics of this policy process, who are the actors, what are their networks, and what are the practices that are involved in enacting uh, policy? And again, there are a huge array of different perspectives. I mean, I'm not saying that these are similar, they're coming at it from quite different uh, theoretical, conceptual angles. But we have, for example, um, the work of Haas and others on epistemic communities, groups of people in uh, technical and other positions who develop a view about a particular policy area and come together to push that, that through. And he studied pollution in the Mediterranean, but there are many, many other examples in the literature around that. Policy networks, this is, again is, is an understanding of how people are inter interact within and outside government to create particular policy uh, networks around which uh, particular views about what policy should be are formed. Um, and there are a variety of different versions of that um, based on different empirical studies, particularly in the US and, and Europe. There's the idea of policy entrepreneurs, that policy change often happens when particular individuals or groups of individuals take that initiative, the idea of, of, of the policy entrepreneur, uh, that they can flip a policy debate dramatically if they create the right moment, the right context, and, and really make things happen. And if our understanding of policy is to be enhanced, we have to look out for them, or indeed, uh, if we're in more activist mode, help create them. In, and often they are embedded in one or other of these networks or epistemic communities. Slightly different to those uh, perspectives, which largely come from uh, political science, political sociology. Um, more out of rural sociology and uh, anthropology, we have the work of marketing in the school of uh, Norman Long and others, who argue that often, and this is a sort of reflection of this frontline worker question, often policy is created and negotiated at what they call encounters at the interface. That if we understand policy in practice, we really have to understand the conversation uh, that that extension worker is having with that farmer about what policy is and how it, how it uh, plays out. So that is very much an actor-orientated approach um, to, uh, to understanding policy and policy change and development more generally. And of course then we have this now very broad and quite diffuse uh, uh, area of theory around actor network theory coming from Bruno Latour and Chicalon and others, um, which describes in a variety of ways the processes of enrollment and enlistment of people in, in, in knowledge networks, but not only people but uh, non-human actors actants in their, uh, their terms in trying to understand how uh, policy or science uh, more broadly changes. <coughs> so we have a perspective based on understanding broader politics and perspectives based on actors and their networks and then importantly and this to some extent is where our group at IDS at least came from initially trying to understand uh, how narratives um, discourses and, and constructed knowledges emerge in policy processes. Way back, Melissa and her former colleague Robin Menz produced a book called The Lie of the Land, which tried to understand how uh, particular visions of African environment and development were constructed. 
and indeed got stuck in particular policy settings. And it was very much at that point where we engaged with the work of Emery Rowe and others uh, to understand uh, narratives and discourse and then associated practices uh, and the way knowledge gets constructed in policy. I'll come to that a bit more in a minute. So, this, if you're going to remember one thing from this session, it's three overlapping circles. Um, I'm sorry to dumb it down so much, but we actually have find it useful sometimes to have something quite simple to remember. Because if you've got a, a library full of literature bearing down on you, um, sometimes it just feels so intimidating that you'd give up. So this is what, how we think about things in our rather simplistic way. We say, we make the argument that to understand policy and policy change, one has to have three lenses on it. The overlap, of course. Um, one around discourses and narratives. How is that policy constructed? How do we think about the, the, uh, the narrative of, of that policy? One about politics and interests. Who are the who are the who are the main interest actors? Who, how do they compete with each other, and so on? And who indeed are the actors and networks and associated practices associated with each of these discourses and narratives and broader interests? What we also argue is that policy change happens when a combination of these things shift. So it may emerge through a new narrative, which captures a particular academic community or actor network, which helps shift the politics interest to create policy space in the middle there. But equally the opposite may happen, there may be a closing down and a constraining of uh, what <coughs> policy is and how we understand it. 